Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit in our midst, the same Holy Spirit which inspired this scripture would now come and illumine our minds and hearts to hear and receive what you have to say to us. Lord, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive and wills ready to obey. And we pray for all of this, not for our sake only, but for the sake of the glory of the name of Jesus and the building up of your church in his name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. My name is Curtis Froisland. I'm a priest on staff down at Grace Anglican. If you haven't met me, I've been up here, I don't know, maybe a half dozen times now. Um, and it's, it's always a joy to get to come and uh, preach, share in the ministry of the word with you. And this morning, I will get to celebrate for the first time uh, with you. And so that's awesome. Um, I'm married. I have seven kids. I've been in ministry for a long time, but I've only been an Anglican for like two years and um, so forgive me if I mess anything up. Uh, so uh, we have a big family, and we had the opportunity at the beginning of this summer to go to a family camp. We drove all the way to New Hampshire, uh, 17 and a half hours according to the GPS, and I think when you go on a road trip with kids, you just enter into a time warp, and it just, I don't, it takes ages. But we, we drove all the way up there. I was the camp speaker and had the opportunity to share out of First Peter with a very diverse group of people, but all who, all who were there with their family. And we had a great time. It was, it was fun the, the first couple of days, you know, just kind of getting to know people, getting to know the, the camp and how things run and schedule and that sort of thing. But then the middle of the week, we had this, this strange day happen. It, could, it had been kind of misty, uh, you know, a little drizzly a couple of days. But in the middle of the week on this Tuesday, out of nowhere came this very powerful thunderstorm, like one of those microbursts where they, that they talk about, where suddenly it's just like torrential downpour, you know, gale, gale force winds, lightning and thunder rattling the cabin and that kind of stuff. And it, and it just came out of nowhere. And at the same time, I have a son who has type 1 diabetes. We have, a, we have he's, his blood sugar is just like plummeting. And we've given him apple juice and apple juice and candy. And it's just n nothing is bringing him up. And so there's this crazy storm happening outside and this, this uh, anxious situation that's happening on the inside. And, and, then, and then the storm was gone. And you know how it is when you're, when you're not at the, the center, the scuttle, but by the time it makes it to you, it's expanded and it's far worse than, but, but we heard that a tree had come down and hit one of the buildings in the camp, and that there were campers who were injured, and some of our kids were out there. And so my wife goes sprinting out, you know, into, into the rain and to the other side of the camp while I'm there with my son Gabriel trying to get his blood sugar going. It was a, we were having a, a normal, fun week, and suddenly crisis was all around us. Stress was all around us. Fear was welling up in us because of these fearful and anxious situations. And I, I'm sure that you've had an experience like that. You're just going about your day when suddenly you are attacked or overwhelmed or um, entrenched in these situations that cause such fear and anxiety. And, and one of the interesting things about that fear and anxiety is it has a way of lingering with you, doesn't it? Like even after you've passed the moment of crisis, even if after you've passed the ultimate moment, you can just kind of feel it reverberating under your skin. And I think my wife, you know, this was the beginning of June. I think my wife is only just now kind of coming down off of that, that fear and anxiety. My son was fine. Our, both of our sons were, were fine, and, and it was overblown. There was a tree that, that hit a building, but um, nobody was seriously wounded or anything like that. But, but we know what that feels like, being overwhelmed with fear. And I think, think about a time when you felt that way, and, and you will be able to connect with what David is describing in Psalm 55. I think the big idea that David wants us to hear is that when fear makes you want to flee, flee to God. When fear makes you want to flee, flee to God. Because life is full of these anxious and, and fear-inducing situations, isn't it? I, I mean, I love the way that King David, we know it's King David because the superscript says it's a mascal of David, a psalm of David, but I love the way he describes the feeling of fear, of anxiety in verses four through eight. He, he uses multiple different synonyms for fear. He says in verse four, my heart is in anguish. Verse five, I'm, I'm experiencing fear and trembling. It's on the inside, but it's also on the outside. You know, like I'm, I'm vibrating with this fear and anxiety. And then verses six through eight, uh, as we read, if, if, I could, 
If I could become a dove, I would fly away. If I could get out of here, I would run, right? And, and maybe you've felt that way. Maybe you've, maybe you've had a, an anxiety, an ex- episode of anxiety or a panic attack or something like that. It feels very much like this, that, that there's tumult inside and outside, and I just want to run away. Maybe you've seen that on Ted Lasso. Maybe, you know, you've seen Ted Lasso, the, the fictional um, soccer coach, and his panic attacks. David is, is deeply troubled by what's going on around him. And, and look, what is, look what is happening. It's, it's outside. It's inside. It's, it's friends. It's, it's everything seems to be coming down. In verses 1 and 2, he, he cries out and he asks God. He says, God, don't hide yourself from me. This, I'm, I'm being overwhelmed with all of these things that are happening. My life and my livelihood are threatened. He says in verse 3, he can hear the sound of the enemy, the sound of those who hold a grudge against him. They're coming. They're sort of, um, you know, they're mustering the troops, so to speak, and to come out and, and get him. They're after him. Then he says, not just outside the city gates, so to speak, but, but on the inside. Did you notice how he described inside of the walls? He, here, here are the words that he described for the people that, that he lives with, right? Violence, strife, iniquity, trouble, ruin, oppression, and fraud. Everywhere where he looks in the city. It feels as if everyone's out to get everyone else. Everyone, no one is, is about the common good, but everyone is about enriching themselves or empowering themselves at, the, um, at the cost of the power and even safety and security of others. My wife, Kelly, she went to um, fashion design school for college, uh, a, a big fashion design institute in California. And people, when they find that out, they're like, oh, wow, that's so cool. Like, what was it like? Did you like it? Was it, you know, that sounds so interesting. And she's just like, mm. it was terrible. And she was like, it was terrible because it was cutthroat because everybody was out to get everybody else. You had to be constantly be looking over your shoulder. You know, there wasn't a sense of like, we're all in this together, trying to make our way, trying to learn how to use our creativity. It wasn't like that at all. It was, you were embattled against every other student and even against the professors and the other people that worked at the school. It was cutthroat and people were out to get each other by hook or by crook. And so that's kind of what David has experienced. Maybe you've felt that way in your, in your workplace or in your extended family, that there's just always someone who just wants to put you in your place or get one over on you or take advantage of you or make you look the fool. That's the type of situation that David has going on as he looks around and sees violence and strife and iniquity and ruin and fraud. But then he says in verse 12, maybe he, he moves to something that's even more heartbreaking and just as, as heart, heartbreaking as it is, it's deeply fearful, like the thing we would most not want to happen. He says in verse 12, I could bear this if an enemy was coming against me, but this is my own friend who has turned against me. Verse 13, it's my my companion, the one with whom I took counsel together, the one with whom I walked in the house of the Lord together. They've turned on me. We, We were Members of the people of God, we worship together, we pray together, we read the scriptures together, we encourage one another in the good news of God's faithfulness, and yet even this one has turned against me. I'm sure some of us can resonate with that. We've been in the church for a long time, and, and we've been let down from time to time. The very people that we thought we could trust, the very people that we thought would come to our aid, come to our protection, turned out to be the ones who turned on us and betrayed us. And then finally, a particular form of betrayal David is facing. He talks about the manipulation of his friend. It's not just that, you know, they were friends and then at some point this person had an occasion to turn on David, but that he discovers that all along that person has intended to turn on him. That they were biding their time until they could get one over on David. He says in verse 20 that his friend violated this covenant you know, a covenant, the sacred promise that, that these friends have together to uh, love one another, to protect one another, to care for one another, to hold one, an up, one another up. This former friend has violated his covenant and that his speech was, ESV says, smooth as butter, right? He just, he said everything right. He always had the right word, always whispering the right thing in David's ear. But all along, that was just a ploy. All along, that was just a plan. Because those words were really swords 
David says, and they were warfare in his heart. Perhaps nowhere in the scriptures do we see an example of this more than when Judas betrayed our Lord. And he comes, gives the sign to the the soldiers as to who they should arrest. And what you remember with the sign, a kiss. Oh, what a, what a horrible expression of betrayal and manipulation. A sign of love and faithfulness and friendship becomes the sign of betrayal and hatred and even death. So this psalm, even as we think about David, we also think about Jesus, that this psalm is, is a foreshadowing of our Lord. For he was the one who had enemies arrayed against, me, against him. He was the one who saw uh, evil all around him. He was the one who was betrayed and manipulated and forsaken by almost all of his disciples. And he had the, the wickedness, the, the violence, strife, iniquity, trouble, ruin, oppression, and fraud laid on him that we might be forgiven. David is foreshadowing what Jesus will experience in the gospel. And because we are, we've been united to Jesus by faith, what we will often experience in a broken and sinful world, this tumult and this fear. So what does fear and anxiety teach us about ourselves? We've been, at Grace, we've been going through this sermon series. I've been, uh, my, our, our rector Mike has been on sabbatical since the beginning of June, and I've been filling in, and I got to pick which text we were going to be preaching on. And we've been preaching through these psalms that help us to explore um, the emotions that God has given us. And not, not just to knock them out of our hearts with a Bible verse, but to dig deeply in them and to understand where they're coming from and to discover how God is the answer to those emotions. And so as we think about fear, we think about anxiety, often, this is, this is a common uh, definition of fear and anxiety, often fear and anxiety are related to issues of control. That when something that we deeply value or deeply need is out of our control, out of our ability to protect or to accomplish or to fulfill, that is when this, um, this feeling of fear and especially a, a lingering anxiety will pop up in our heart. One of my friends is, was a um, professor at RTS, PhD in psychology, and he, that's how he described it. He said, you know, when, when the most important thing in the world is threatened— and you can do nothing about it, that's, that's the heart of fear. That's what anxiety really is. It makes us face the fact that we are not in control. And often, it also makes us face that we don't even have, that even if we were the ones pulling the levers of, or making the decisions, we actually don't have the capabilities necessary to protect or accomplish the things that we mo- most deeply desire. Things are out of our control because they're out of our capabilities. They're out of our abilities to control. Like, like look at David, right? He can't control what the people outside of the gates are doing. He can't even control the people inside of the gates. The very people that he thought he could most trust. He can't even control his bosom friend. He cannot even control their behavior and how they respond and react to him. And that, that's the third thing that I, I think fear makes us face is that fear raises the question, who can I really trust? Who can I really trust? You know, if you've ever struggled with anxiety, one of the symptoms of clinical anxiety is actually paranoia. You start to think, I can't trust anyone. I can't trust anyone to help me. There's this thing that I need, and I can't do it myself, but I also can't trust anyone else to do it. And so you get stuck in a cycle of fear and anxiety. Because life so often reveals that you can't trust the people that you need to trust. Now, nothing in the psalm says exactly what David's situation is. You know, like Psalm 56, the next psalm, describes when when he was in the land of the Philistines, that that's where uh, Psalm 56 came from. But Psalm 55 doesn't give us that. It's just sort of general, um, general descriptions of David's life. But it's hard not to hear, if you know the story of Scripture, it's hard not to hear in the sort of echoing in the background, the rebellion of David's son, Absalom. If you remember this story, Absalom, when, he, when he's grown, he, he ends up turning the people of Israel against David so that the, there's basically a civil war that Absalom's people come against David and David and his sort of um, close friends have to abandon Jerusalem and flee 
for their lives because David doesn't want to face, he doesn't want to fight against Absalom. And so it's out of David's control to accomplish these things. And then the worst part of it, perhaps, is that David's good friend, his advisor, Ahithophel. Now, if you need a baby name, Ahithophel (laughs) is a great, I guarantee you there's not going to be anyone else in the church or in your neighborhood that has an Ahithophel. So Ahithophel is David's, uh, one of David's advisors. He is one that David would have walked in the house of the Lord, that they, he would have worshipped with him. He, when something was, you know, when a situation like this was happening, Ahithophel would have been the type of person that David would have said, what should I do? What would the Lord have me do? But even Ahithophel has turned against David and sided with Absalom. And so there's tumult outside and the rebellion of his own son and, and the manipulation and, and betrayal of one of his closest friends. He's facing the reality that he's not in control, that he's as capable of a, a king as David is, right? And he's a, he's a good king, all things considered. He's a great king. He has, he has a lot of abilities, a lot of gifts, we might say. And yet, even he comes to a point where he's completely overwhelmed and he no longer knows who he can trust. But, praise God, we have Psalm 55 because Psalm 55 helps us. What do we do when everything feels out of control? What do we do when we realize that our abilities far, fall far short of what they need to be? What do we do when we're not sure who we can trust? Look at these verses together. Verse 19 The first thing David reminds himself of and wants to remind us of is that when we feel out of control, God's not out of control. Verse 19, he, God, is enthroned from old. He is the one in this little section um, from verses 16 to 19. Uh, or verse 18 and 19. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them, for he who is enthroned from of old, because they do not change and do not fear God. God is the creator. God made everything. God rules over everything. When, when life feels out of control, God is still in control. When you know you're not in control, God is still in control. Even mysteriously, when it feels like, God, are you in control anymore? God is the ruler, the one who is enthroned of old. I always think of Acts 2, chapter uh, chapter 2, verse 23, where this, this paradox sort of meets in the scriptures, where it says that Jesus Christ was delivered and crucified at the hands of lawless men, that it was wicked and sinful and evil and rebellious of people to do that, and that it happened according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. I mean, can you imagine a situation in which you would have felt more like, is God no longer on the throne than when his own son is delivered up to be crucified? And yet the scriptures encourage us and say, God sees things that you don't see. God's doing things that you can't yet see. When it feels like life is out of control, God is enthroned. He rules. Secondly, as we face our inability we face our lack of capability. We face our, our um, you know, our Madden rating isn't high enough if we're, uh, anybody's a gamer. Um, God promises to sustain his people. Verse 22, he says, he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. Now, David's not saying that God will automatically uh, fill you with the gifts necessarily necessary to bring the resolution that you hope to bring, right? But that he will sustain you and that um, he will never permit the righteous to be moved. He will give you everything you need in that situation to, to hold fast to him because he's holding fast to you. He will hold you up by the power of his Holy Spirit and through his means of grace, uh, worship and prayer and the scriptures and our fellowship together and the Lord's Supper. God will sustain us even when we are overwhelmed with fear and anxiety. You know, sometimes I think um, we, we look out at the world and we see how tumultuous it is. And, and we, then we look back at church history and say, we need 
you know, we need Augustine to come and like fix everything today. We need St. Clive, right? C.S. Lewis to come and fix everything. But, but isn't it true that God puts the people that are right for the situation in the moment of history that he wants them to be in, right? He, those apostles that we look to and, and, and give God thanks for, those were the right men for the time. And those church fathers were the right, and mothers were the right men and women for the time. And those reformers were the right men and women for the time. And I have to think that we, brothers and sisters, are the right men and women for this age. For God will sustain us. It doesn't mean we're going to um, accomplish our goals and our dreams and our checklist. But God will sustain us and he will not let the foot of the righteous be moved. In Hebrews chapter 13, one of the beautiful Um, benediction doxologies in the New Testament. It says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you see what I'm saying? That even in the midst of the fearful situation, yes, God may not resolve that situation or allow you to be the catalyst that resolves that situation, but God will give you everything you need to do his will and be pleasing in his sight, even in the fearful, even in the, even in the darkness of something like David's facing with the rebellion of Absalom. So, so God rules, and secondly, God sustains. And then finally, When we don't know who we can trust, we can trust the Lord. God is faithful. God is righteous. He doesn't go back on his word. He isn't, uh, his words that are uh, words of encouragement and words of consolation will not turn out to be words that are swords and war like the the people that sometimes betray us. This is a theme that runs actually all throughout Psalm 55, you, you might have noticed, David cries out in verse 1, Hide not yourself from me, O Lord. And then in verse 9, he says, Destroy, O Lord, <laughs> these enemies. Divide their tongues, kind of echoing the, the story of the Tower of Babel, right? God, mix up their language so that they can't um, go on working together to do evil and wickedness in your... But, but God, destroy, bring judgment on them. Verse 15, To the friend who's betrayed and abandoned him, he says, let them, let this one, this one who abandoned me and betrayed me, let them go down to Sheol, the land of the dead. God, bring your judgment on this one. And then verse 23, uh, an expression of confidence in God's justice. For you will cast them down into the pit of destruction. And our, both our epistle and our gospel reading connected with that theme as well that there's a day coming when the wheat and the tares will be separated. There's a day coming when God will restore and make all things new. And there's a day coming when when all the untruth will be revealed. And all the betrayal will be brought out into the light. And all the times when you said you were wronged and nobody believed you, God's justice will prevail. Our ultimate confidence, our ultimate hope is not that we will resolve those things which cause us deep fear and anxiety, but that God's justice will come when our Lord Jesus returns. We say week by week in the creed, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. His kingdom will have no end. No one will escape his perfect righteousness. No one will escape. No one will be able to go on hiding the animosity and the hatred and the betrayal and the evil. So what do we do? How do we, how do we take these things to heart, right? I like how David ends, uh, verse 23. We, we just were talking about the first half, but you, O God, will cast them down into the pit of destruction. Men of blood and treachery shall not live out half their days, but the very last line, but I will trust in you. And that I, and so in, in Hebrew, you don't usually need the personal pronoun because the verb implies who the, the actor or the speaker or the recipient of the verb is. So there, the I is not necessarily necessary, but it's there in Hebrew, and that usually means it's an emphatic I. So you could, you could really translate that or read that as like, but I, I will trust in you. I myself, I will trust in you. David, this one who it seems like everything has been upturned. 
And there's just evil and wickedness and betrayal and manipulation everywhere he looks. He hopes in God and he trusts in him. Do you trust in God this way? Do you trust that God is the one who rules? Do you trust that God, um, that, that, that God will sustain you? And do you trust that in the justice of God, that Jesus has borne your sin and that when he returns, you will be part of the wheat and not one of the tares. But I, David says, I will trust in you. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, our Heavenly Father, I, I pray by your Holy Spirit that these things do not ring as easy answers or platitudes, but God, divine truths revealed in the Holy Scriptures to encourage and empower us, your people, as we face hardship and evil and sorrow. And Lord, as we fear and find ourselves anxious and overwhelmed, we pray you would help us to always remember and to encourage one another that you rule. You will sustain us. You will give us everything we need to do your will. And Lord, um, so deep in our hearts, a confidence and a hope in the return of Jesus his perfect justice, and the restoration of all things. Lord, we look forward to the day when we will be free from sinning and enjoy perfect fellowship with you. We pray for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.